thanks for the great introduction. Uh, if you want to detect any kind of malicious content at scale, machine learning is very useful. But as you all know that machine learning has lots of problems. It's inexplicable, it can be easily fooled, and most importantly though, machine learning is designed to solve the average case, whereas in security, we are focused on detecting anomalies, things that rarely happens. So one of the questions I often worry about is that, is machine learning useful for security at all? So this is, answering this question would be the main goal of my talk. I'll talk about some of the mistakes that we can avoid uh, to make sure that machine learning is still useful in the security context. So let's try to build a malware detector using machine learning. So like any other machine learning system, you will start with a, a labeled data set of malware and benign content, and it will extract features and then train a model. And once we have a model, we can use it to detect any new file that uh, we want to detect. Like any other system, the quality of the model depends on the quality of the data. But it seems that in the malicious content case, uh, getting a good label data source for malware is very difficult. So let me give you an example. Let's suppose you have this code that connects to an external uh, command and control server and does something malicious. Do you think this is malware? I think most of us would consider this as malware if this is doing something malicious. Now let's suppose uh, over an extended period of time, this bot master disappeared. So now this piece of code tries to connect to an inactive IP address and does nothing because now uh, no one is commanding it to do anything malicious. So is this still malware? As it turned out, the answer depends on who you ask and when you ask it. So one way to uh, find the maliciousness of any file is to ask VirusTotal. VirusTotal shows the uh, uh, decision of many commercial antivirus systems in one place. Uh, if you, uh, uh, we were able to find a uh, specific malware that fits this definition. For this piece of malware, uh, it was connecting to a uh, command and control server last year, and over time, now the control server is inactive, so now it does not do anything. So according to VirusTotal, in September 2019, 42% of the antiviruses considered it as malware. But if you check virus total in January 2020, 72% of the antivirus consider it as malware. So there's two things to consider here. First is that the labels of antiviruses change over time. So these labels are not uh, constant static labels. And the second thing is that all the antivirus companies are not always in consensus about what is malware. So that brings me to the first question of this talk, is that how can we expect to protect users from malware when people who are in the business of detecting malware are not always in consensus about what is malware? So let's take a step back. Let's consider that you are a malware researcher and you want to figure out the best way, uh, the best source of malware uh, by doing analysis by yourself. So the best way to do this would be uh, run a, a piece of code on an end user's machine, and do static and dynamic analysis. Now, this is obviously not uh, realistic because people are not gonna lend me their machines to run malwares on. So you can do the same kind of analysis on a virtual machines. This kind of analysis will take hours to do just for one malware, so this is not very realistic. A better way to get uh, dynamic and static analysis data is using an open source sandbox, for example, Cuckoo. So Cuckoo performs um, dynamic, and uh, dynamic and static analysis of codes and provides a suspiciousness score. And based on uh, some threshold, you can consider a piece of code as malicious if it has a certain level of suspiciousness score. This usually takes one or two minutes to do per file, which is still uh, really time consuming if you want to do this analysis for the millions of data that you need to train a robust machine learning model. So this is why research papers take a shortcut. Uh, they get labels from other sources. We studied 40 papers from 2001 to 2019 to check how do they get their ground truth from. So it seems that 50% uh, of these papers get their ground truth from a collection of data that someone else put out. Some researchers 
uh, meticulously did some analysis and uh, created a repository of malware, so then other research papers use that label data to train, their, train and evaluate their system. Another popular way to get labels uh, for malware data is uh, from VirusTotal. VirusTotal shows the antivirus labels of, uh, many, uh, from many different antiviruses, so you can use those labels to decide if something is malicious or not. Uh, a small amount of, a small number of papers, we found only three, that did some manual analysis on a small amount of data and used that for training and evaluating. The papers that uh, use virus total data to decide what is malicious uh, are not in consensus about uh, what is the right threshold to figure out the maliciousness of a file. We found that there are some papers that use labels from one antivirus system. Some papers consider that if four antivirus system consider something as malware, then it's malware. Some papers think, no, the threshold should be five, and maybe 10 is a better threshold. Or maybe all of the antivirus should consider something as malware for a file to be malware. Some papers think that maybe we should do some kind of majority voting. Other papers notice that all the antiviruses are not equally accurate, so doing majority voting is not a good idea. So maybe we should do weighted majority voting. So you can see here that research papers are also not in consensus about what, what is the best threshold to use. And when you're, when you're uh, building a data set for training and evaluating your system, what is the basis of your data set? Uh, that is problematic, because let's suppose you are a malware researcher and trying to figure out the best way to detect malware. And you are reading all these papers, but how do you compare them? because each one of them used a different data source and a different threshold and a different way of evaluating their approach. So just by reading these papers and comparing their accuracies are not going to give you a much, a much better idea about uh, how to uh, detect malware. So we did a study of uh, antivirus systems uh, to figure out this problem. We noticed that on virus total, um, uh, top antivirus companies are sort of in a consensus. Uh, uh, they, uh, but we also noticed that the labels of the antivirus systems change over time. In our data set, we found that 96%, uh, the antiviruses reached 96% agreement on our data set after three days and reached 99% agreement after three weeks. So this gives us an idea about a simple heuristics that we can use to create a, uh, a stable ground truth data set. So there are two things to consider here again. One is that antivirus labels change over time. So we shouldn't use the label that appeared today. We should wait for a while to, for the label to get stabilized. And the second point is that uh, antiviruses are not in consensus about every piece of file uh, about the maliciousness of the file. So instead of when we are building this ground truth data set, instead of taking all every piece of malicious data, we should focus on the piece of data that the majority of the antivirus companies are in consensus about the, their maliciousness. So now let's suppose, now that we figured out how to get the best ground truth data to train and evaluate our data, uh, we build our classifier. How would we uh, evaluate the performance of this classifier? In a general machine learning case, we focus on the overall performance of the classifier. But in security, the overall performance of the classifier does not matter much, because in security, we are concerned about the special cases, the rare events. Even though the number of malware today are way more than the number of malware we received 10 years ago. Still, on a regular basis, an end user has way more uh, benign files than malware files. So we need to make sure that the false positive rates of these classifiers are really small. So instead of focusing on the entire performance of the classifier, we need to compare classifiers in this, uh, in this zone of interest where the false positive rate of the classifier is significantly low, less than 1%, but it also has a high true positive, over 90%. Whenever we are talking about um, using machine learning in security, we have to think about adversarial attacks. Because at least in security, we always have this active adversary who are always trying to evade our system. Adversarial attacks is one of the uh, mostly researched area in machine learning and security. There's more than 1,500 papers on adversarial machine learning. 
since 2014. Uh, many of these uh, attack papers, many of these papers are also defense papers, but they often get broken before the papers get published. Uh, we wanted to see, uh, uh, do these papers help us understand the security of machine learning? Do these papers help us understand how uh, many of them, uh, many of these attacks can be used to evade real-world antivirus uh, uh, systems? We found that only 36 of these papers, only 2% of these papers, uh, tried to focus on evading malware detectors. Another thing we notice is all of these papers focus on answering this question. Can adversarial malware evade malware detectors? But a better question to answer for the security audience would be, are adversarial attacks harmful for users? Now, if you look at this question, it seems that these questions are the same question, right? That an adversarial malware that evades malware detectors are obviously going to be harmful for users. But not quite. It's because the way, there, there are more than one ways to do adversarial attacks. One way to do adversarial attacks is changing the malware file and create a real world malware. We call this kind of attack the problem space attack. Another way to do adversarial attack is do the attack on the feature vector that you extracted from the malware file. So if you are concerned about how well your machine learning model do when you do, uh, do adversarial attacks, then doing the attack on the feature vector is good enough. But if you want to figure out uh, whether these adversarial attacks are harmful to users, you have to be able to transfer your attack from the feature vector to a real world malware and see, is this realistic? Is this malware, can this malware exist in the real world? So now let me give you an example why this is not, the, the feature vector and problem, problem space are different for malware. Because in other domains, it's not that different. For example, images. Uh, one of the, uh, one of the e most common attack that you can do a uh, common adversarial attack you can do in the malware domain is adding a new section to the malware. Since you are just adding a garbage section to the malware, it should not affect the maliciousness of the malware. But that's not what happens in reality. Uh, when we tried to do this attack on some of the malware, we noticed that in many cases it produced a malware that, uh, that was not even a valid application. And in some cases, it's produced a malware um, that was not malicious anymore. This usually happens when the new section you added overrides an existing section. Now, I'll give you two examples why this, uh, this override action can happen. So here's a um, primer on how Windows malware work. So Windows malware have uh, three sections, the headers, the executable sections, and an overlay section that does not get loaded when you load the uh, program in the memory. So some malware uh, keep some of their maliciousness in the executable section, but keep many of their uh, malicious uh, program in the overlay section. And once they're loaded in the memory, they load the malicious code from the overlay section to the memory. Some, in some times, when you try to add a new section, you might override the overlay section. And in that case, uh, the malicious functionality of the malware might get affected. Another case, when you're trying to add a new section, you have to change the header of the file so that um, uh, the file has an idea at, that the new section has been added. But in some cases, if you don't have enough space in the file header, it might override some of the sections in your file. And that could also result in a corrupted file or a file that just does not do anything. So, we wanted to see, uh, in all the research papers, how many asked this question, that are adversarial attacks harmful to users? We found that only one-fourth of the papers changed the malware files. The rest of the papers did their adversarial attacks only on the feature vectors. Uh, among these papers, only four papers tried to execute the file. Now, just uh, trying to execute the file and see that the file runs does not help us answer this question because the file has to be malicious for this attack to be harmful to users. So do you want to guess how many papers checked if uh, the attack was harmful to users? Yes, zero. <laughs> so this is probably one of the reasons why uh, academics do these adversarial attacks and contact industry 
industry people are often like, thanks for letting us know, but we don't know what to do. Another reason could be that um, evading one classifier is often not enough to evade the entire pipeline because commercial AVs has to go through a series of detection uh, before it, it gets detected as benign or malware. There is signature-based detection, there is static detection, and there is dynamic detection. Um, you can do an adversarial attack uh, by evading the static detection, but if you click and run the malware, it will get detected by the dynamic analyzer. So re in research case, just show the static detection. That, uh, that shows that uh, we were able to evade the static detector, but it wasn't able to show that uh, this malware actually runs and it's harmful to the users. So as far as antiviruses are concerned, adversarial attacks are still not harmful to the users. So that brings me to the last point of my talk. Whenever we are building uh, security applications, we need to worry about, we need to talk about who is the adversary. Uh, in a cryptographic system, we have a notion of an adversary which is bounded by computational complexity, but we don't have such a notion of an adversary in the machine learning case. Uh, papers usually talk about white box adversaries that have full access to the system, or black box adversary that has no access to the system. But if you read those papers, the fine prints, and most of the papers are actually considering gray box attacks where adversaries have a wide range of uh, incomparable ca capabilities. So some papers consider that adversaries have full access to the features, or the adversaries can do unlimited queries, the adversaries has access to the training data, the adversary can create a, a, a perfect substitute classifier. Now some of, these, uh, are, some of these capabilities are realistic. For example, uh, the malware author and the malware defender are both working with malware, so they probably have some ideas about the features and the training data. But other capabilities are probably not that uh, realistic. For example, if an adversary is sending unlimited queries to an antivirus system, it will get blocked because most uh, practical antivirus system will consider that as, as a malicious action. Most importantly though, there's just no way for us to compare the capabilities of all these different kinds of adversaries. Uh, an adversary that has full access to the features or the adversary can do unlimited queries which one, is, which one is the strongest adversary? We don't have such a notion to compare these two adversaries. And this is problematic because if we don't have a notion of uh, the hardness of the attack and defense, we cannot track progress in this area. Uh, even if we are defending at some sort of attack, we cannot say that this is better than what it was before. So in summary, uh, to build a realistic machine learning model for security, we need to come up with a notion of a consistent ground truth. Uh, we need to evaluate our classifiers in the realistic bound in low false positive rates. Uh, we need a notion of measurable adversary. Uh, so far, we have simple heuristics uh, uh, to build consistent ground truth and evaluation, but uh, to create a measurable adversary is still an open problem. And that ends my talk. Thank you. Thank you.